passage I'm reading from is Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 18, and it can be found on page 1054 in the Church Bible. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ask Betty to come up now, please. <laughs> Pray for you before you speak to us, Betty. Lord, we just thank you for Betty, for her servant heart, that she is your daughter and you are her father. And we ask this morning that her words are the words that you want her to speak to us and that our hearts are open to receive them. Amen. Morning, everybody. Okay, so today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, um, traditionally, where I'm coming from, is a joyous day. We go to church all dressed up, ready to celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you. Because we have the palm, and when we read in the Bible, when it says, Hosanna, that everybody there was shouting, Hosanna, in the highest. I want to tell you that the word Hosanna, it means something. It's not just a praise word. It means, in the original Bible language, it means God save us. It's a cry of a people that have been waiting for years. Us here in Christ Church, we've been waiting. We've been waiting. And we are going to shout Hosanna today. Symbolically, yes, it's Palm Sunday. And we are going to say, God, save us. Send us the right vicar that's going to lead us into the promised land. We need 
that person. So raise your palm up and shout, Hosanna! 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 God save us. Amen. So, Wendy came, you know, told me I was going to preach today. I said, okay. I didn't know I was supposed to get a passage that I'm going to speak on because I automatically thought, well, it's Palm Sunday, so we read one of the Palm Sunday, you know, uh, passages. So I said, yeah, we can go with the Luke one. The triumphal entry is found in the Gospels. So in um, Matthew, we have it in Matthew 21, from verse 1 to 11. In Mark, we have it in Mark 11, 1 to 11. And then the look that we've just read, and John, is in John 12, 12 to 19. And this talks about when Jesus came into Jerusalem. Now as we read that passage, there are some few words I want us to actually take note of. One, Bethany. Two, Bethage. Three, the colt or the donkey, whichever one you pick. Bethany, what does it? Beth, uh, let's start with Bethpage. Bethpage is a suburb of Jerusalem. It's just a little town outside of Jerusalem. What does it mean? It means house of the early figs. And Bethany simply means house of affliction of house of poverty. So this, are the, this is the place where Lazarus and his sisters lived. This place, Bethany, the house of affliction. It comes to us so many times, and you know, when we read it through in the Bible, it's nothing, it's just a place we read through it. But slowly I begin to notice something when I read through the Bible that you have to read through, read and get what those words mean, what those places mean. Because most of the places we read through, they have a meaning. There is something beneath what he's saying. See, Jesus did not preach riches. He was helping others. He was not, you know, a weak man. I was listening to um, Ravi Zachariah preach the other day, and he says, you know, if you want to actually compare Jesus, he wasn't a feeble man that cannot fight for himself. He's a God in the first place. He could have actually silenced them with just a wave of the hand or just a single word. And on a, if you look at it earthly form, he was a carpenter. Carpentry, you know, lazy people don't do carpentry, do they? It's a physical work. So he wasn't a lazy man. He could have fought at any time. And those are the things that were going on in that place. Now, we want to look at the cults. The donkey, however we call it. See, donkeys were not used for war time. But that is what Jesus chose to come in 
to Jerusalem. He could have chosen a horse and ride in like a big king, but he chose a donkey. When you look at all these things that are written, um, the use of the donkey just did not happen by accident. Now, when you look at things that are written in the Old Testament, when they come to the New Testament, they come alive. So the donkey bit, you will see it in Zechariah 9, verse 9, where, you know, the prophet says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king come to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. So he didn't just pick the donkey. This was written years ago in the Old Testament. So it was a fulfillment of a prophecy. When you look at things that are happening in the New Testament, they are a fulfillment of prophecy. See, when we look at the donkey again, the owner of the donkey was told that Jesus needs it. Just take note of the word that the Lord needs it. There was no explanation. And the owner did not say, how dare you come to my house and take my donkey? It belongs to me. Now, some of us, we have, you know, we are so stuck in our ways. We don't want to move. Who owns you? He. God owns us. But because we are stuck in our way, we don't want to move. You see, the donkey would have stand, you know, stood his ground and not want to move. But they went. What are we doing? Are we like the donkey? Are we ready to go where God said we should go? This week, somebody asked me something, which when I was um, preparing this, it kind of Play through my mind too. Most of you know that um, I, those had my friend on Facebook really know that I sell some stuff. And um, a lot of them are making a lot of money from it. And I'm like, oh, I want to stop working, stay at home, and do that too, like everybody else. So I'm asking this young girl that is making a lot of money from it, I say, come, how come a lot of people ask me about this thing, but they're not buying it. And she went, um, Auntie Betty, if you are not doing the business already, <laughs> do you think if you saw your page, you will want to join your business? I'm like, I didn't actually go into anybody's page before I joined, so yes, I will join. But then, as I'm looking through this, it makes me want to ask this question. If somebody is outside, if a donkey sees us today, will they automatically want us to ride on it? Are we ready to ride on that donkey? Are we making ourselves ready? We have different, you know, different things in life that takes our attention from where God wants us to go. This donkey was ready to fulfill the prophecy he didn't know about. But are we ready, so ready to do God's will? I know of a guy well, I'm guilty of that too, but when he was growing up, 
People keep telling him, oh, you're going to be a great man of God. And he became a lawyer instead of going to do the work of God. And um, slowly, this you know, confirmation keep coming and coming. But he would listen. And I said to him, you know, Bruce, you need to listen to what God is saying. And he went, well, someday. The wife was not making it easy either. He said, mm, me, be a pastor's wife, God forbid. It will not happen. They fought that for years. But you know when God wants something to happen, if you like, be like Jonah that refused to listen. God has his own way of doing things. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. Why? Because he was judgmental. I think he's better than those people in Nene. Oh, they are sinners. They are dirty, useless people. I am better than them. I don't want to go to them. They are murderers. I won't go and preach to them. So he ran the other way. He had only 700 miles to get to Nene. But he went like the opposite direction because he refused to go there. And that's what this, my friend, did. He did that, and slowly, the wealth he was uh, enjoying slowly started to crumble. And it took time. Somebody called him and said, you know what? You need to listen to what God wants you to do. And today, The miracles that God works in his life and through him is amazing. And, you know, sometimes things happen in our lives and we say, why is this happening? God, where are you? He's there. He wants you to say yes, like the owner of that donkey. He wants you to allow him to use you the way he wants to use you. Not what you want him to do. He's the one that molded you. You did not mold him. He molded you. And you should allow him to work things out his own way. Our ways are not always right. His ways are always right. We need to learn to listen to him. Chris prayed, prayed earlier and talked about, you know, repentance in the middle. We need to repent, change from being like Jonah. Look at people and see them as God see, sees the pe people around us. I have my notes, but I think, hey, this is what God wants us to hear today. We need to treat people like, you know, like God treat them. I remember, you know, a few years ago, I had problems with my husband. And I actually told him the marriage was over. And then the Lord started working on me. And I'm like, but I did nothing wrong. <laughs> and um, he wanted me to love him the way he loved me in spite of my sins. I have a lot of flaws, but God loves me in spite of those things. Jonah needed to love the people of Nineveh in spite 
of their flaws. But he didn't want to do that. We need to learn to love people. I ask if we are ready. If we are a shop. Just standing in front of Bushmead here, advertising for you to come in. Do you think you will come in? Do you think we are ready to receive the people that God have prepared to come into Christ Church? Are we ready? Are we willing for God to use us as he used the donkey? We need to ask ourselves that question today. Jesus came in this time riding on a donkey. He was going for peace. He was giving himself, presenting himself. Imagine all the time. Remember when he did the first miracle when he turned the water to wine? When his mother was calling him, what did he say? It's not your time. But this time, this time it was time to show himself up as the king that he is as the Messiah. Everybody that was there that day were not his friends. Some came to see this man that raised up that dead man the other day. The man called Lazarus. Some came to kill him. People that are around us, they are different people. Some love us, some don't. Some say they love us, but they actually don't. Some of them were there saying Hosanna on that day. Hosanna, throwing their clothes on the floor. But in reality, they actually did not love him. They didn't wish him that good. But still, God allowed all of them to be there. In the same way, everybody we see in our lives, they are there for a reason. God allowed the good, the bad, and the ugly. We need them in the journey. Sometimes if the journey is too quiet, you start sleeping on duty. God wants us to be awake. Variety, they say, is the spice of life. If we are a shop in Bushmead, and you are walking past, will you be happy to come inside this church? If you have everything in your life and you have no need for God and this place is there, Christ Church door was just opened there, will you be happy to come into it just to come and fellowship with the people in here? With my work with people, you know, underground in this place. You have people that, oh, I actually would have wanted this, but because of this, or because of that person, because of this person, I did not. 
Your salvation does not depend on anybody. It's a personal, a personal journey. On that day of judgment, no one else will go and stand there with you. When Jane was speaking earlier, he says, you know, yes, she got to a spot that she thought, you know, do I actually want to continue here or go somewhere else? I was there too. But the Lord said, this is where I planted you. If God had planted you here, be willing to allow him to use you just like that cult, the donkey, was used. We all have a part to play. The finger can never say it's not a part of the body. You think it has no work? Try and cut it off and see how, you know, how important this little finger is. Try and cut it and feel the pain. The pain that will shoot through your body. No matter how small any member is, they are important. We need to learn to stand together. We sing a lot of songs, you know, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. We started with Hosanna. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. Show us the way to go. Find Christ church together with cord that cannot be broken. We have some lessons to learn. We must be ready and willing for Jesus to claim us, to use us. He is the one that made us. He actually have a right to use us for his glory. He is God. We did not make ourselves. Let's give ourselves totally. Don't give him 1% and keep 90%. It doesn't work like that. And giving 100% still know to look after yourself. I know what happened in churches like us here. The one percent that does the work carries everything. Let's keep praying for those that are doing. Jesus was praised. Do you think praising him was wrong? when they were shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us, and they were putting, you know, their clothes on the road and putting palm branches. That's, you know, the, those things that they were doing, they did that to welcome kings in the olden days. He was a king. He was praised. Is it wrong to praise somebody? No. He received his praise with humility. He did not say, yeah, I'm the king, so get out of my way. Today, I'm just going past. No, he received his praise with humility. Let's learn to receive praise with humility. I am one of those, you know, like when they did um, our personality and who we are, I was told I was a, a servant by nature. So a server, I will serve everybody and... Um, not think about myself. I can empty my fridge and give to people without thinking about myself. When I came to Christ Church and I saw Magda, I'm like, oh, she's a servant. 
because we are not hard to find, you know, to notice. What am I saying? We are different. We serve. But as a server, we should learn to take the praises of people and people's offer to serve us, to help us. Let's take it and say thank you. And learn to sit down when we are offered that help. It took a lot of learning for me to even learn to say yes to the offer. Even when... um, When I am doing something and they say, Betty, sit down, I find it hard. But I have to learn. And the other thing that, you know, I think we can pick from this is, if you see Jesus, you know, even though he was coming triumphantly, he was looking at Jerusalem and weeping over it, you know, at the the, the un on repentance and the wrong that they were doing. So he was rejoicing into the city, but he was still in pain for them. So rejoicing and pain can go hand in hand. We cannot say, oh, because we were we had some pain, then it wasn't rejoicing. Life is not all you know, roses and honey, it all go hand in hand. God is at work in our lives. But we need to allow him to do his work. We cannot tell him how to do his work. He created you. If he wants to use you, allow yourself to be used by God you will find peace.